there we go. Okay, so I'm sitting here. We're on the flight to Minnesota, and I have met Renee and have been fortunate enough to sit next to her, and um, she's helping with me with my iPad. And trying to. <laughs> trying to. We're not having a lot of success, but uh, so we're making uh, sweetness out of adversity, and we're going to do a video of our own instead of watching someone else's movie because Renee is a dairy farmer and um, they have a small herd of cattle in Wisconsin and we've been talking about the troubles of dairy farmers and so on and um, this is an issue that's really important to me and so I'm very grateful to Renee for agreeing to be interviewed. I do a YouTube channel, an activist YouTube channel. It's primarily an anti-nuclear channel. But um, I also do food issues and social justice issues and, you know, things like that. So, um, how do you want to start? Do you want to just tell me a little bit about, you know, kind of what, where you're from and what you do and anything like that? We're from a small town, well, we're a rural area, about 60 miles east of Minneapolis, Minnesota. We raised five children on our dairy farm. Our dairy farm consisted of, at that time, about 300 acres. We had a herd of about 48 milking cows. Um, in uh, about 2005, our son bought our cows from us. He had owned half the, cow, the herd by then, because since he was in junior high or maybe even younger, for an allowance, the, the boys would get a, a calf oh. a few times a year, yeah. and he would raise his up. And he was very big into embryo transplanting and flushing the cows where they would like super ovulate them and then he would take his, his the eggs from these registered cattle and put them in the great cattle and then that would build this herd with more registered cattle. So he is um, a couple of years out from having the cow herd that he purchased from us all paid off wow. and then he will be buying the property they purchased. He also bought my mother's farm, an 80 acre farm, which connects to ours on a land contract. And he and his wife live over there now. And dairy farming is just very hard at this time because the prices have not gone up. Um, but unfortunately, fertilizer prices, diesel prices, all the expenses to repair your machinery, all that kind of stuff, that has increased just like crazy. So expenses have gone way up, but income has gone up. So it's a hard, hard life. Yes. And, and do you feel like your, I mean, your son has been with you the whole time, so he's seen it. Do you think that he thinks that um, it will be easier for him, or is he just so committed to the lifestyle that he's willing to give it a go in spite of those economic realities? What's your sense of that? Well, a few, a few things there. He is a dreamer, and he plans on, you know, upgrading and, and making these improvements to the farm. Um, but he's always, since he was two years old, has been an uh, animal lover, and, and it's in his blood. And I once made the comment about his two older brothers having a regular nine to five, five days a week type of job, that they would have weekends and they would probably be more secure financially. And he made the comment that um, money isn't everything, and he would rather be happy doing what he's doing and be dirt poor than be in one of these people who wake up Monday morning and dreading the rest of the next five days. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we could really, our society is so geared toward making money, we can really use um, that mentality in our, in our, in our society as a whole yeah. more to slow down, maybe accept less money, but more happiness, more, um, personal satisfaction and what you're doing closer to nature, yeah. like that. Um, you know, we talked about the, um, the big dairies and the multi-thousand cow dairies, and so how does that land on you? Because I, you know, living so close to the animals, and these animals are, you know, providing your livelihood, really, and you mentioned your son loving animals. 
you know, how how do you feel when you see a five thousand, you know, um, you know, five thousand animal dairy herd? Is that how, you know, we talked about that that is really not a farm, but you know, could you speak to that issue a little bit? Well, number one, it really saddens me um, on many levels. I think when you're, and, and this is just my opinion, and I'm not saying all mega farms are this way, but I don't think the animals get quite the care mm -hmm. and the, let's say, personal attention. Mm -hmm. um, but there are small farmers that, that don't care about their animals, too, so that's, true. that's not the only deciding factor. Yes. But I think the mega farms are making it really hard for the small family farm owners to stay in business because we can't compete. It's just like, you know, how a grocery store, um, a mom and pops are being driven out of business by the big ones because it's all about bulk and it's all about, yeah. you know, how much you can produce. And, and they don't look into account, um, you know, the heartfeltness of, of loving your job and loving tending to these animals. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's I, I kind of think, I think there should be a cap on a herd. Um, I, I think a, a, far, a family farm, each generation, can make a living on a hundred cow herd mm -hmm. um, easily. I mean, we raised five children on a 50 cow herd. Mm -hmm. we, we, didn't, we didn't have everything. We didn't go on extravagant vacations. But our kids always had shoes with no holes if they chose. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> jeans with, with, without... I mean, they didn't hurt anything. They had computers and they had their cell phones as they yeah. got into high school. Um, but the biggest thing that my children have is a good work ethic and a good uh, a good core values. Mm -hmm. um, they know that if you want something out of life, you have to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with responsibility comes responsible kids. Yeah, that's um, true. So. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting idea about the you know, capping the herds, herd size, it's, um, so in your area, so it, here comes the drink car. so in your area, uh, is it just a few big, um, you know, you mentioned there's a ConAgra dehydrator there close to your area, is it, how many, how many big companies are kind of running the show out there? Well, there's a few of them, and then within the last year, I think it was, um, did you hear about what Grassland has done? No. Grassland has, uh, they kicked a bunch of small farm herds off their property because they're building their own dairy, and they don't need the small people. Is that a grass-based, a pasture-based dairy? Um, or? No, Grassland is a, oh. a national, they produce butter. I see. Um, they, okay. they market a bunch of cheese. Okay. You'll see cheese labeled as grassland, but grassland only actually produces butter or manufactures butter. I see. They get cheese in bulk and then they chunk it up and put their, their name on it and ship it across the United States. I see. Um, but there's a lot of them, like Walmart, they're building their own farm. And once they have their farm built, they're going to own their own cattle. It's like they're they're cornering yeah, the market, like so they're vertical gonna have integration everything. or whatever. Yeah, they're they're, they're going to have everything, so they're not going to have a need to get milk bought from anything else. Yeah, and that's as we were growing up, there was all these co-ops around for like either feed mills or milk co-ops, um, and they're they're it's, they're closing down left and right because they can't they can't compete. Um, so it's yeah, real transformation of the economy yeah. from an economy that services smaller businesses. It's like Quick Trip. I don't know. In the Midwest, Quick Trip gas yeah, stations are a big thing. Okay. They, they're doing the same thing. They have their own farm, so they don't need the milk, you know, from the independent people. So when Grassland got their own herd, they, like I said, they dropped hundreds of milk. And then these farmers are left without a place to send their milk. Yeah. They don't know what to do. Right. And even our local dairy where we ship our milk is Conagra. Yeah. And Conagra has a lot of different things. Like they make spaghetti sauce and, and popcorn. And like Orville Red Bocker's popcorn. Or they, they make a lot of... It's a big it's corporation. Big, right, and, yeah. But what they do in our local town is they make the Swiss Miss um, hot chocolate mixes, the yes. dehydrated milk. Mm -hmm. And they make the pudding packs is a, is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, and you see them in the individual little serving cups that you buy in your grocery store. Yeah. Um, but it's to the point where my son is thinking about expanding. He wants to put in a, a parlor 
and, and you know bring the herd up to 100, 150, which would be easy for him to double the size of the herd because he has a lot of young stock out, out in the pasture mm -hmm. and they rotate the cattle so that just because I say it's a 50 cow herd, that doesn't mean we only have 50 cows. There's probably mm -hmm. at least 75 within the milking age at all times because they rotate them in and out of the barn as they calf and, yes. and then, and then right. start milking. Yes. Um, but in order, he has to get the, the dairies, the milk factory where we ship the milk, they're okay before he can expand his herd because they can only handle so much milk product. Oh. So it's like he, he can't, you know, go in and get 150 more cows because the milk facility couldn't handle his milk. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it, it, it's a very complex business. Yeah, you can't really, you can't really make your own choices then. It's no. like somebody's making the choices exactly. for you. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. Wow. Well, so, so, I mean, what do you... Is there any answer for this in our society that this this um, kind of like aggregation of the production of food into? I mean, I'm I'm really I'm really surprised by that. Um, you know, Walmart buying their own dairy herds and this convenience store buying their own dairy herds. I mean, that's really that's really yep. fascinating as a business you know model that a convenience store would own a dairy. Yeah. But it's like I said with Conagra, our local dairy, how they also do spaghetti sauce and yes. and it's these big businesses. It's the big corporate corporations yes. that are um, ruining things. You might say. I mean, yeah. I know it's progress, and there there are good things about it. But part of it also is that you know they are driving all these smaller farmers out because yeah. we can't compete and unless you can ship, you know, 100,000 pounds of milk a day. I mean, just, for instance, we get, what, $13 for 100 pounds of milk. Um, a gallon of milk is eight pounds, so you can do the math. And, I mean, we're getting such a small amount. And then the people in towns, they see that your, your milk is three and a half, four bucks a, a gallon, and they're thinking, oh, these rich farmers. Yeah, and they right. drive, drive down the country lanes and they see these huge tractors, little do they know that those tractors are like $300,000 and most of those big tractors that you see, they're not even owned, they lease them out yes. because a farmer cannot afford to own something like that. And and I really don't see an end to it unless they can cap the, the size of the herd for one thing. But the other thing is the, the, the cost of our income is so low, it stayed the same for 30 years now, give or take, you know, three, four bucks, mm -hmm. maybe five or six dollars tops per mm -hmm. gallon or per hundred weight that we get paid for. Mm -hmm. But but our expenses have, have like quadrupled, mm -hmm. you know, like the cost of fertilizer and, and the diesel and, and the, just the repairs, unless you are a mechanic. And, and know how to fix everything yourself, which yeah. it's pretty hard for one person to to be able to be a herdsman and a mechanic, and a, you know you have to be an agri. Um, you know how to run all your soils, and sure. you know it's very complex. Yes, there's it's, a lot of not, different yeah. disciplines. Yeah, yeah. right. So it's really hard for one small farmer to to keep up and compete. Yeah, unless there was a store where we could go buy the products that we needed at a very reduced rate, which yes. is very Hard impossible, yeah. yeah so. Right. What about, um, so the, um, one of the things I had read was that there was a tremendous run-up in ag land values in the Midwest over the last, say, decade, and so is there that, I mean, you hate to think that that is some kind of like, um, way out but you know I mean you know I mean how much how much in grueling grueling you know five to nine work can a couple yeah, take right exactly. I mean you know at some point you do want to retire and thankfully you guys have kids that are responsible and have been able to um, you know um, you know possibly create a future for themselves in this but um, yeah I mean do you do you think about that? Do you do you think about oh God, let's just sell the land's worth yeah. something? And, you know. Well, several.
multiple things. So, so an acre of land is farmland. Um, we just heard some people bought it for three thousand dollars an acre, which is really huge for, for farmland. Um, there's a lot of people who are no longer dairy farming that are crop farming, and the and that's what brought the price of land up so much. And because when corn was twelve dollars a bushel, um, which is high, they farmed every possible piece of land. I mean, there was land oh, that, that hadn't had been too. farmed for years. They would yes. plow everything up yes. and, and do it. So then what happened was the market got flooded with milk or with corn, yeah. which drove the prices way down. So now corn prices are back to, you know, four or five dollars a, a bushel. Yeah. And, and you've got all these farmers who have, they thought while the corn prices were so high, they did all these expansions, bought all this other property. And now with the price of the corn, in the bottom of the tank, they, they can't make it go. And we've seen multiple big crop farmers that used to be dairy farmers um, going bankrupt and selling everything. And they're, you know, 40, 50 years old, even up to 60. And they're walking away with nothing, you know, because they've they lost it to the, the bank. Debt. Yeah, to pay off the debt. We call them banksters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's also, you know, um, my husband does not want to sell off any of our property because yeah. he thinks at some point the only way your kids are ever going to have land or property or be able to afford it is if they inherit it. I agree with that totally. But, but yet we have five children and there's really only one child who's interested in the land. The others have moved off the farm and have jobs elsewhere yeah. and they really have no no interest in this land other than they want to come home and, and walk the, the favorite woods that we used to do as a family, you know, mm -hmm. when we'd go out for walks and, mm -hmm. and you know, that kind of stuff rec for recreation. Yeah. Um, but yet, if you, unless also if you have a small farm like us or if you have a young person who wants to start farming, it's so expensive to get into mm -hmm. that the only way they're actually going to ever be able to get into it is if it's gifted to them. Yes. And that's how our son will get the remaining property. Um, and you need so many acres to be viable to support yeah. the cows. Right, sure. But yet um, here you are some pretzels. Thank you. And for me you need to here to purchase stamps today. No. You don't want pretzels either. Okay. Yeah, so you it's, don't either. it's it's very difficult, you, you know, yeah. for number one getting in them or not you know. So. Yeah. And I don't know what your other question. I don't remember your. Other oh, questions. I don't. I don't. I don't even either. So. But oh, if you ever think about selling out. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, we would love to, but yeah. um, until our son, and even if our son does quit milking, he still wants to crop farm. So he can get a five to nine job, nine to five job, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. And, and then he would farm in the evenings and on weekends. Yeah. And my husband is sixty-six years old, and. and has always today. farmed. I mean, we both grew up on a farm, and that's all he's ever known. So for him to move into town, it would probably just kill him. He just—he needs something to be doing all the time. He's not used to sitting around. Um, so I can't see—I can't see it that our, our property would ever get um, partially off and sold. But yet, that's the only way that us farmers will ever. Get rich you just yeah. just a by parsley, yeah. and that's why you see around the cities, the, the like encroaching serve? cities and the suburbs that are, are in where corn used to oh, okay. grow. Do you have a glass of ice that's corn? where they make their money is yeah. by parceling it and, yeah. and subdividing it, go. making the suburbs. Yeah, that's true. I, I was stunned when I went um, back to the Twin Cities area, the suburbs around the Twin Cities. Over the last few years, all of the areas south of Stillwater, there was so much beautiful farmland yeah. there, and it's just all it's subdivisions. Yeah. I do know another family friend who, his family um, grew up on this huge farm. Um, the, the, the grandpa generation, the first generation, they ended up selling it to two brothers, and there was you know, nine or 11 kids in the family. So they sell it to the, one, the two boys, for a very reduced price because number one that's the only way they're going to get into it to keep it in the family farm they would you know they're all for it so then generation number two they grow old they want to retire their kids 
one one of their children, the third generation, now says, okay, I'm going to farm it. So then he gets it passed on to him at a low price. Meanwhile, 10 years go by, the kid decides it's too expensive or too hard work, whatever, I don't want to do this anymore. So now he's at the point where he's subdividing that farm and he's going to get a boatload of money where the other grandkids, you might say, from grandma's farm aren't getting anything. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the things we think about. We have the five children. We want to help them leave all. everybody. Sure. But in order to do help the one who wants to farm, you got to give it to them at such a, a low cost, right. which is fine because we can't take it with us and, and we would just as soon see him farm as long as he can make a living doing that. But what happens 20 years down the line when he's still you know, a middle-aged man decides he doesn't want to farm, and then he has all this, you know, potentially it's worth two, three million dollars, and his siblings are still struggling trying to pay off their student loans, hopefully not in 20 years, but yes. you know, it, it could happen. Sure. Um, so it's just, you just really don't know which yeah. way to go. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, really challenging problems facing farmers, farm families, and I'm really grateful that you agreed to do a little interview with me yeah. here and we'll wrap it up because we're getting to 20 minutes gets to be a big video. Okay. So um, thank you very much for nice. yes. that. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. A pleasure to sit next yeah. to you and get to know you. Yeah. All right. The other thing though, I think it, um, it's very important for the public to know where our food comes from and the fact that it doesn't come from a grocery store. Yes. Um, and there is no better value than something that is homegrown, whole, made from a caring family. Yes. Um, that, I mean, there's nothing better than whole food. And I think the, the public in general is coming back to that now by going to your co-ops and stuff in, in the garden and the farmer's markets. You're coming, the public is coming to realize the value of what we've been doing all these yes. years. Yes, and the whole, and the, the complete connection, because it's not just the nutrition of the food but like I think what you know part of maybe of what you're saying is that there's like a spiritual connection yeah. it's completing the whole um, you know the growing the growing and preparing and eating of food is, is a it's a sacred act and we've taken it out of that realm and put it into the realm of factories yeah, just trying to mass produce yeah. just to make more of the almighty dollar and right. That really is not the value that we we should be where we should be putting our value. It's true. Yeah. Thank you for that, Renee. Yes.